Welcome back to Tony's tutorial and in today's video we are going to have a new start that is we are going to start with the shoulder complex biomechanics. I know many of you were eagerly waiting for this video and today is the right time that we start the shoulder complex discussion. It is of course confusing shoulder complex a shoulder joint a glenohumeral joint something like that okay but shoulder complex is a broad term which includes five joints in particular oh god five joints yes five joints which is the sternoclavicular joint the acromioclavicular joint the glenohumeral joint which we call as the shoulder joint in uh, anatomical terms and then the scapulothoracic joint which is not at all a function an anatomical joint but only a functional joint and of course some of you might not have heard about this that is the subacromial joint or suprahumeral joint of course the subacromial that is a subacromial space that subacromial space is now considered as not a joint but a subacromial space itself so we have only four joints to study or explore that is our sternoclavicular acromioclavicular glenohumeral and scapulothoracic joint and of course three bones are contributing to this uh, four joints the sternum the clavicle and the scapula are the three bones that are linked in the shoulder complex of course the shoulder complex import discussion is very important because we see diverse conditions in which uh, the shoulder pathologies are seen in right day-to-day -day life in our clinics and in our daily practices we see patients with a lot of shoulder problems and proper biomechanical knowledge is important in proper diagnosis and uh, rehabilitation especially because the shoulder is a highly mobile joint you don't have this much in the range of motion in any other joint and this mobility is contribute com compromised by the stability right so it is less stable that predisposes it to various injuries so he, throughout this discussion we are going to study each and every joints of the shoulder complex and then an integrated function this video we start with the first important joint that is a sternoclavicular joint i promise you this discussion throughout this week will be very interesting and we will explore shoulder complex biomechanics and pathomechanics in the most simplified manner going to start with the sternoclavicular joint the sternoclavicular joint the name itself is self-explanatory that is its articulation between the sternum and the clavicle but that's not the complete picture anatomical textbook refers it as uh, the articulation between sternum and the clavicle but biomechanically if we evaluate we see that it is an articulation between the clavicle the sternum and the first costal cartilage that is something that we have that is the sternum clavicle and the first costal cartilage to understand every joint we devise a strategy we will first describe some few introduction about that joint an introduction about the sternoclavicular joint is this sternoclavicular joint is a joint which is between the sternum clavicle and the first costal cartilage the second important thing is that the sternoclavicular joint is the only structural continuation between the axial skeleton that is your center body your axis of the body the axial skeleton of the body with the appendicular skeleton or with the upper extremities the arm and forearm so this is the only joint this joint is the only joint which is connecting your axial skeleton to the appendicular skeleton so these are some few important introduction about the sternoclavicular joint of course we have a strategy in describing any joint you just have to remember a few important points or head things what is that you need to understand what is the type of the joint okay then you need to understand what are the degrees of freedom of the joint these are some easy ways of memorizing every joint for your examination point of view or through your clinical career type of the joint degrees of the freedom then you have to remember the articular surfaces then you have to remember the associated structures of the body of the joint associated structures or accessory structures then you have to remember the motions of the joint 
So if you describe any joint in this five classification, it's so easy for us to understand and study it. Let us examine one by one. First one, what is the type of the joint of the sternoclavicular joint? The sternoclavicular joint is a plain synovial joint. What type of joint it is? It is a plain synovial joint. Here comes the dis here comes the difference. If you Google it, you will find out that sternoclavicular joint is a saddle joint. But I told you it is a plain synovial joint. Why? That is because it is true that the articular surface of the clavicle, that is the medial end of the clavicle, as well as the sternum, the manubrium of the sternum, is a bit of saddle shape. That means it's a reciprocally concave convex. But we don't see a saddle shape like this. A large saddle shape, we don't see it. The saddle shape is actually very small or very minimal. So we cannot even tell it as a, a saddle joint. So that is why in biomechanical discussion, we take this as a plain synovial joint. Also, the saddle joints would be having a bit more articulations. For example, these are two saddle shape structure. This is a convex. It may articulate like this. It may be concurrent. It would be concurrent. But this joint is uh, inconcurrent too. So these two reasons makes us to consider this joint as a plain synovial joint. What is that? The saddle shape of the articular surface is very minimal. Saddle shape of the articular surface is very minimal, very minimal. So the first important thing we got, the type of the joint, that is a plain synovial joint. The second one is that what, how many degrees of freedom does this joint has? The plain synovial joint, it's a triaxial joint. Therefore, it will have three degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom? It has three degrees of freedom three rotatory degrees and of course definitely there will be three translatory degrees three rotatory and three translatory motions or how many degrees of freedom three degrees of freedom for this joint and now we take the next one that is the articular surface of this joint the articular surface we described earlier is formed by the medial end of the clavicle the clavicle sternum and first costal cartilage of course let us take it in a more depth let us do it in, in more depth because we need to examine and uh, describe the articular processes in detail. So we have the clavicle over here and we have the sternum over here. Okay, we have the sternum over here. We see that the articulation is in fact made between the medial end of the clavicle. Of course, right? The medial end of the clavicle and the manubrium sternum more clearly the clavicular nodes in the manubrium sternum so what is that it is formed between the medial end of the clavicle and clavicular nodes in the manubrium sternum if we expand our concept we see that the medial end of the clavicle is not completely in articulation with the manubrium sternum the clavicular nodes in fact, only the antero-inferior part of the medial end of the clavicle is in articulation. The superior part, which is this one, and the posterior part is left over. So that is not going to articulate with the manubrium sternum. So, uh, expanding the concept, the articular surfaces are the medial end of the clavicle and the manubrium sternum. But we see that the medial end of the clavicle is not completely articulating with the manubrium sternum or the clavicular notch of the manubrium sternum. In fact, only a small portion which is antero inferior, that region is articulating with the manubrium sternum. For example, this articulates like this. So you can see the leftover part, the superior part and the posterior part is leftover. It's not going to articulate in the manubrium sternum. So the sternoclavicular joint is an articulation between medial end of the clavicle, more peculiarly antero inferior part of the medial end of the clavicle with the clavicular notch of the manubrium sternum. Now you see the difference. This is the clavicular end, medial end of the clavicle. You can see that this is very large in section. But if this is completely articulating with the manubrium sternum, this joint would have been a concurrent one. But only a small portion of it is been articulating. That makes 
the joint incongruent and that is why we told this joint is an incongruent one only a small portion of the medial end of the clavicle is articulating with the manubrium sternum and that makes the joint an incongruent one that makes the joint an incongruent one. but you should also remember that this is a saddle shaped one the articular surface are saddle shaped but we don't consider the joint as saddle one because the saddle shape is very minimal. Saddle means it has a reciprocal concave convexity. One part will be convex over here, the other part will be concave. The one part will be convex over here, the other part will be concave. So a reciprocal concave convexity is seen between this articular surface. So that is an important discussion with regard to the articular surface. Something that you should remember is the medial end of the clavicle is not completely going to be in articulation. Some part of it, as the antero-inferior part, is only been articulating and other parts are left over. And there we have the attachments of ligaments and the disc, which we'll discuss later. Now, we saw the articular surface. Now we need to understand what are the associated structures, okay? We need to understand what are the associated structures. One is the disc. Now we described that the sternoclavicular joint is incongruent. This incongruency actually puts the demand that this joint has to be stable because this is one of the most important joint connecting axial and appendicular skeleton and it has to be stable and that role is provided by your sternoclavicular disc. If you are a student, this is very important. The sternoclavicular disc is very important with regard to your studies. If we look at this diagram, we can see the medial end of the clavicle, we can see the clavicular of the manubrium sternum and we can see the first costal cartilage and now we have a structure known as the articular disc the disc of the sternoclavicular joint is fibrocartilaginous in shape what is its shape it is fibrocartilaginous in nature the disc of the sternoclavicular joint is fibrocartilaginous in nature it has a superior attachment so it will have a superior attachment over here okay it has a superior attachment which is known as the upper portion of the uh, upper portion of the disc so this upper portion of the disc will be attached to postero superior part of the clavicle postero that is posterior plus superior so postero superior part of the clavicle the upper portion will be attached and this disc will be running like this and the lower portion will be attached to what you call the manubrium and the costal cartilage and the costal cartilage costal cartilage see so this disc is actually diagonal in its section you can see from this diagram it is passing from the superior part posto superior part of the clavicle to the manubrium and the first costal cartilage and thus this disc divides the joint cavity into two and this disc joins, divides the joint cavity into two. That is, the sternoclavicular disc is a diagonal shaped structure like this, which in fact divides the joint cavity into two shapes. The superior portion or upper portion is arising from the postero superior part of the clavicle and lower portion is arising from the manubrium and the first costal cartilage. So this is the sternoclavicular joint disc which is a very important structure which is having a superior attachment or upper portion which is attached to the postero superior aspect of the clavicle and the lower portion which is attached to the manubrium and the costal cartilage and divides the joint cavity into two uh, two compartments maybe an upper and a lower compartment upper compartment and a lower compartment now we need to understand what is the function of this disc the sternoclavicular joint disc is having two functions one is that it is a function of stability and second is the function of force dissipation what is that it is a function of stability as well as a function of force dissipation let us examine the function of stability we saw that the sternoclavicular joint is an incongruent one and of course there is less articulation between the sternum and the clavicular nodes 
okay the clavicle and the sternum not uh, clavicular notch in the manubrium sternum and what happens here the disc is actually attached from the superior to this manubrium therefore this disc increases the contact between both the bones right in fact it is contacted only this much so but here there is a disc acting on so this disc increases the contact between the surfaces therefore it increases the concurrence so that is the first function of stability that is it provides to the stability by increasing the concurrence of the joint by increasing the concurrence of the joint second one it prevents the medial translation of the clavicle we saw that in fact the clavicular notch is the clavicles only one portion is actually sitting over here if the clavicle is like this only a small portion is sitting on the sternal notch clavicular notch in the sternum so it can get dislocated like this it can move on like this when the medial directed force is happening on because only small area is in contact so this sternoclavicular joint disc provides to the stability by preventing the medial translation of the clavicle if clavicle can move medially like this if the clavicle is going to move medially it may get dislocated from the joint it may move away from the joint from the manubrial notch the notch in the manubrium so it provides to the stability by preventing the medial translation by preventing the medial translation of a clavicle see these are the two ways in which it provides to the stability what about the force dissipation we know that in the task like this okay there is a lot amount of forces that is transmitted from lateral end to the medial end and then to the sternum so this clavicular clavicular uh, medial end and the sternal end can get a great deal of compression but here we have a disc which is unique so this disc actually dissipate this lateral directed force from medial directed force from the lateral side so the force which are medially directed from the lateral side are actually dissipated or being uh, taken away by the disc and it protects what happens it protects the joint from high compressive loads so that is a function of force dissipation it helps in it helps in dissipation of a medially directed force medially directed force from lateral side from lateral side and thus prevents joint compression excessive joint compression the disc is also having one peculiar function at the time of motion that is disc behaves in a peculiar manner during motion the function of disc during motion okay we know that uh, for example two sternoclavicular joint motion one is elevation one is depression one is protraction one is retraction how our disc is going to behave in this manner okay when we are elevating like this when we are elevating like this our disc will be stationary that means your disc will not move when you are elevating your clavicle or depressing your clavicle your disc which is attached to the sternum and the man, uh, first costal cartilage as well as the clavicle will not move that means it's a sub upper portion this is the upper portion upper portion this is the lower portion which is attached to the manubrium and the costal cartilage this upper portion will move that means the upper portion will act as the pivot around which this motion happens so the upper portion will act as the pivot but the disc as a whole will not move right that is the first thing whereas in protraction and retraction okay protraction and retraction this movements the disc actually moves with the clavicle okay disc actually moves with the clavicle here the the noting point or the pivot point is your inferior aspect so this inferior portion will prevent the dislocation or movement of the disc so it will control this motion so we have two scenarios one is elevation depression where the disc is stationary because it is attached to the sternum and this there is no motion in the sternum happening okay whereas in this movement the disc in fact is moving together with the clavicle and the manubrium the clavicle manubrium and the disc in fact to move together 
so in first motion disc is stationary and in second motion disc is mobile so we say that during elevation and depression the disc is part of which one the manubrium because disc is not moving right whereas during protraction and retraction the disc is part of clavicle because disc is moving are you able to understand this concept That's, it is simple that is your sternoclavicular disc can behave in two manner one is that it can move or it cannot move when elevation and depression if you look with the disc is not moving the disc is permanent like this okay the disc is permanent like this just the upper end act as a pivot the disc see for example you can look at my finger the disc will act as just a stationary structure but whereas in protraction traction of course my finger is moving up front and backwards that is your disc is moving so when disc is moving the clavicle is moving so we call it as the clavicular part the disc behaves as a clavicular part in protraction retraction whereas in innervation depression it remains stable with the manubrium so we call it uh, the stable with the manubrium so we can conclude that the disc behaves what with the manubrium during the elevation depression and disc behaves as a part of clavicle during protraction and retraction that's all about the sternoclavicular joint is you must remember it has an upper portion and a lower portion two attachment one is to the posterior superior part of the clavicle one is the posterior superior part of the clavicle and another one is to the manubrium and the first costal cartilage right okay now we are how to study the next associated structures that can include the joint capsule the joint capsule okay the joint capsule of sternoclavicular joint is a fibrous joint capsule and it is a strong but it is not the structure that is providing the greater amount of stability of course it's reinforced by the ligaments and the disc is attached to the sternoclavicular joint capsule but it's not the complete structure that is providing the stability the stability is in fact provided by the ligaments so the sternoclavicular joint disc which is studied is attached to the clavicle the manubrium and the costal cartilage also it has some attachment with the capsule also i forgot to mention that it also has some attachment with the capsule also so that's all about the joint capsule and finally we move on to the most important thing that is the ligaments of the sternoclavicular joint what is that the ligaments of the sternoclavicular joint let us examine what are the ligaments of the sternoclavicular joint okay for example you have the uh, clavicle over here you have the sternum over here okay you have the first costal cartilage over here now uh, always in biomechanical discussion ligaments are something that most of the students forget and even the professionals we often forget the names of the ligament and we cannot relate it for that we have some simple methods what are the bones over here one is the clavicle one is the sternum one is the costal cartilage okay so sternum and clavicle sternum and clavicle are related to each other so we call it as sternoclavicular ligament the first one is simple that is a sternoclavicular ligament which is attached like this so that is the sternoclavicular ligament okay what is that sternoclavicular ligament that ligament is having two parts or two ligaments are there one is this one the anterior sternoclavicular ligament which can be shown like my hand over here then of course the behind of this the same thing is the that is the posterior sternoclavicular ligament so if the clavicle is this one if the clavicle is this one uh, one ligament is over here this is the anterior sternoclavicular ligament and my posterior hand is the posterior sternoclavicular ligament you can see this one like this the anterior sternoclavicular ligament and posterior sternoclavicular ligament can you tell me what is the function of this ligament that's so simple that is anterior translation posterior translation so this one prevents the anterior and posterior translation you can see this one so this one is going to prevent the anterior translation to this direction and posterior translation to this direction so the function of a sternoclavicular disc what is that ligament sternoclavicular ligament is restriction of anterior and posterior translation it is having of course anterior sternoclavicular ligament it is having another one which is the posterior sternoclavicular ligament so these are restricted by these are restricting the anterior and posterior translation translation means 
the anterior moment. For example, if this is the manubrium, this is the uh, clavicle, the clavicle can move anteriorly like this. This is anterior translation is restricted, posterior translation is also restricted by anterior translation, anterior sternoclavicular ligament and posterior sternoclavicular ligament. In that posterior sternoclavicular ligament is more having the restriction rod. Now, the next ligament, we studied the first ligament. In fact, the number of ligaments is three. The first one is the sternoclavicular ligament. Sternoclavicular ligament, we studied that. Now, what is other structure over here? Yeah, I have my costal cartilage over here. I have my ribs over here, right? So the ribs is attached to the clavicle. Costoclavicular ligament. What is that? The costoclavicular ligament. That is the costoclavicular ligament. The ligament which may be seen attached like this. That is the costoclavicular ligament. So the second ligament is costoclavicular ligament. This also you can remember if you just remember this diagram. That is a costoclavicular ligament. This ligament is in fact having two laminas. How many laminas? It is having two laminas. That means two fibers two fibers one is an anterior lamina one is an anterior lamina which will be arising from ribs to the clavicle in lateral direction so this will be the anterior lamina this is running in the lateral direction this is the lateral side this is the medial side we have the posterior lamina which will be arising from the same ribs itself but in the medial direction see this is the medial direction. So we have the two laminas for this sternoclavicular ligament and it is a very strong ligament too. That is the medially directed posterior lamina and a laterally directed anterior lamina. Once again, if the one lamina is like this from the ribs to lateral direction, we call it as anterior lamina and the lamina is from the same rib to the medial direction we call it as posterior lamina so we have two laminas for sternoclavicular clostoclavicular ligament that is anterior and posterior lamina right anterior and posterior lamina now what are the functions of this uh, sternoclavicular joint uh, sorry costoclavicular ligament can you guess what are the functions the functions is in fact like you can see that the clavicle is attached over here. This is something like a pulley or something like a spring which is attaching the clavicle to the uh, lower bottom of the clavicle. So this elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle, okay, the elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle more than the usual or the normal elevation is actually restricted by this ligament. Uh, it will tell you, of course, you can move, move, move. But after some time this ligament will get taut so this ligament will actually prevents the uh, elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle because here we have this costoclavicular ligament so it will prevent excessive elevation or elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle at the same time this dissipates superiorly directed forces there are some forces which are superiorly directed superior pull of various muscles like sternocleidomastoid etc so this will be prevented or dissipated by this sternocostoclavicular ligament so two functions one is that it prevents the elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle the second function is that it dissipates the superiorly directed forces. It dissipates the superior for directed forces. And it has one more function. Can you remember that? Any guess? It prevents the medial translation of the clavicle. This also prevents the medial translation of the clavicle like this because this ligament is attached like this. So it will prevent the medial translation of the clavicle. So that is your costoclavicular ligament serving three functions. One, it is prevents the superior translation, sorry, elevation of the lateral end of the clavicle. That is because the lateral end of the clavicle movements are visible. So we take the reference point as lateral end of the clavicle. At the same time, it dissipates some superior directed forces and it prevents the medial translation of the clavicle. And finally, what is the other bone over here? We need one more ligament. That is, this clavicle is attached with the another clavicle. That is the interclavicular ligament. What is that ligament? Interclavicular ligament. The name itself is explanatory. That is interclavicular ligament. Attaching both the clavicles. So that is the interclavicular ligament. Okay. So the interclavicular ligament attaches both the clavicles. And this is having a very important function. 
what is that it is having a very important function because you can see that here to here this is attached so you can have clavicular elevation and depression after some depression this will not allow the clavicle to depress the lateral end of the clavicle because through the lateral end of the clavicle below that you have the brachial plexus subclavian artery excess of extra passing over so if this is getting excessive compressed with the first rib and other associated structures that can cause the compression of the nerves and that uh, vascular bundles and that can cause create a lot of problems so this one will be attached like this between two clavicles and it will not prevent it will not allow excessive lateral excessive downward movement or excessive depression of the lateral end of the clavicle not the median end is not the problem median end is a little more stable the lateral end is the mobile one so here it will prevent the excessive depression of the lateral end of the clavicle and will thus enable the protection of various neurovascular structures which are passing beneath the clavicle and the first rib, right which are passing beneath the clavicle so that is an important function and one more function is that see this is the attachment so if this clavicle want to if my clavicle has to move superiorly like this oh this clavicle want to move superior like this is it possible no because there are two ligaments that are attached so it will again prevent superior translation of the clavicle it will prevent the excessive superior translation of the clavicle so that's all about the ligaments three ligaments very easy to remember the function is also relatively easy just you have to pay some attention the sternoclavicular costoclavicular and interclavicular ligaments interclavicular ligament is important because it prevents the lateral end of the clavicles excessive depression and now we have the motions that are left over to be frank, I thought that we should conclude the motions also with the same video, but now itself it took late more than 30 minutes. So we'll wind up for the session and in the next video, we'll look into details of the motion of a sternoclavicular joint, which are elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, anterior and posterior rotation of the clavicle. And now we have the motions that are left over. To be frank, I thought that we should conclude the motions also with the same video, but now itself it took late more than 30 minutes. So we'll wind up for the session and in the next video, we'll look into details of the motion of a sternoclavicular joint, which are elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, anterior and posterior rotation of the clavicle. If you like the video, don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel.